What's happening, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And in just a moment, we're going to be joined with my guest, Matt Thomas. Matt, thanks for being here. To those of you out there doing your thing, thanks for being here. Thanks for spending some time with us. We're going to have a lot of fun today. And if you're new to the show, please make sure you visit whistlekick.com. Check out everything that we're doing over there. And if you want to go deeper on this or any other episode, it's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. The full complement of show notes, transcripts, all that good stuff is over there. Matt, thanks for being here, man. I'm stoked to be here. I'm glad uh, glad that we could get in touch via yeah. our, our mutual friend, Sensei, Sensei Seth. Seth's a great guy. And, and I already like you because you're wearing cans. And very rarely do, do the guests have cans on. That That's a sign that you spend some time recording some audio. <laughs> You know, I, I, it, it came along with the live streaming life. It does. So, uh, so yeah, I, I like the wireless. I, I can roam around my, my apartment and still have some sort of connection to the, the computer. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't get tethered too far. So I, these are my recording headphones. In fact, when I spent what might've been too much money on them, I promised myself that I would, <laughs> they would not stray from the computer. And once in a while I will sit, I, I've, I have several pairs of great headphones, but these, these ATs, these audio technicos, I will sit down periodically and listen to music with them. And it's just a different experience. There's nothing yeah. like a good pair of reference headphones. I, I get it, man. And, and, uh, I have a friend who's an audiophile that has all the speakers, all the, you know, uh, headphones that cost as much of a car as a car. It's like, you know, listen to this, hear the difference. I'm like, it's a little better. Like, I get it. <laughs> like, if, if, I don't if know if want, it's like a Tesla better, but you know, if you want good music, you can spend like 50 to a hundred dollars. If you want a tiny bit better than that, it's mm. adding a zero. And it's, you know, for most things, it's not worth it. I mean, these weren't stupid expensive. These were like 150 bucks. But they've lasted. I mean, you can see if you look closely. I, I, I had to, I had to wrap the pad on the top with some gaffer's tape. Hell yeah! But yeah, there they we still go. sound great. Well, yeah. um, I, I am nerdy in many ways and could actually enjoy a conversation on audio. And <laughs> I mean, you threw in that Tesla comment. We could probably get into cars, but that is not what we are here for. We're here to talk about martial arts. And I don't know where you want to start. I know a little bit about you. I know you do something that. Here we are. We are coming up on episode 900. We have not had anybody that I'm aware of on this on this show that has t- that has done at least this one thing that I know about you. So I'm I'm going to How about this? Here's the scenario. We're at a party and somebody in, mutual knows us. They introduce us. And they're like, "Jeremy, you should meet Matt. He does martial arts." I'm like, "Oh, Matt, you do martial arts?" And that's where you jump in. I can jump in right there. Yeah. So I, once, uh, for one, I'm very flattered. Uh, you know, in so many words, you're calling me a one in nine hundred guest. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang that up on my wall. <laughs> uh, but it, what, what, what Jeremy is referring to is, uh, I am a chess boxer, and uh, often I'm, I'm misheard in loud party environments. So the first time I said that to you, you might have been like, "What boxing with your chest?" It's like, no, no, the board game chess and the combat sport boxing combined uh, is, is my passion, my, my sport. So, uh, and, and I'm, I'm pleased just... to know it. And, and this, this is right. So we're going to get to a very nerdy Venn diagram intersection. And actually, it's funny that my hands did that. Wu-Tang Clan did not invent it, invent that. <laughs> it's true. Uh, they did have a song in the 90s called The Mystery, Mystery of, of Chess, Chess Boxing. Boxing. And, right. uh, and so a lot of people in our community uh, are, are big Wu-Tang Clan fans. Um, and we use a lot of their, their music. Uh, nice. They were actually in our official documentary. But they did not have a hand in creating the sport. It was actually born from a different style of art, uh, comic books. And uh, a, a French comic book artist named Enki Belial depicted his protagonist as a martial artist who would summon his opponents to a, a real life chessboard and then do battle with strength and strategy on that chessboard. And the founder of our sport was inspired by that comic book series and created a rule set for chess boxing in 2003. Uh, so that was 20 years ago. And that was 15 years before I got involved with the sport. 
Uh, okay. So there are collectively probably a dozen questions that I'm I'm hearing in the back of my head and just, you know, imagining what the audience is is saying. But here's I think the one we we've got to start with. How do you even find out about this as a thing <laughs> so you can say I want to do this thing? Yeah, so my my chess boxing origin story <laughs> is, is your, a little your wild. Issue 1. Yeah. So we, we need to back up a little bit. Okay. Um, and then I'll tell you how I found chess boxing. So growing up, I was raised predominantly by a single mom. She worked, which meant after school, I needed to be doing things until she was done with work. And those things that she got me into were martial arts and chess club. Hmm. So martial arts really shaped my body, uh, how, how I move and chess shaped the way that I think. And I, I started with Taekwondo, so a very kick heavy art. Um, but I, as I grew up, I got more interested in, in balancing out uh, my, my repertoire. So in college, I started boxing. I joined the, the University of Georgia boxing team um, and, and learned how to, how to use my hands. And all the while, I, I played chess casually. I, start, I stopped playing competitively as a, as a teenager. Uh, but I, I always kept it as kind of a, a hobby and something I would, uh, you know, do while I was watching TV or do while I was in class or, or whatever. And so, uh, fast forward into like mid twenties, I, I was an amateur boxer. I, I got injured in a match to a, a degree where I needed to get shoulder surgery. Mm. I was laying in my recovery bed, getting chubby after the surgery. And I was watching a lot of martial art videos like, like Seth's uh, and, and, you know, old boxing fights and that kind of thing. And I was playing online chess because I had a lot of downtime and I could, I could kind of, you know, dust off the board. So uh, YouTube serves me a video, you know, that like sidebar, which says next up. I didn't even click on this video. It auto played. And it was a chess boxing video. So I, I'm like, I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, I'm waiting for like Ash and Kutcher to pop out and say punk. Yeah, okay, or... so you did have the reaction I would expect I would have. Yeah, There's I it was no way up. this is real. No, it was like an SNL skit. Like what, yeah, you know, okay. like who, who, who made this up? How does this exist? It doesn't seem real. And that's generally like we're back in the party scenario and we're just meeting. That's generally the first reaction. It's, it's incredulous curiosity. It's, it's, you know, this can't possibly exist. Tell me more. And, and that's kind of how I felt, you know, watching this video. I was like, okay, uh, you know, that was weird, but let me dig a little deeper here. So I found some articles. I found some other videos. I tracked down the contact information for our founder, Ipe Rumping, and I sent him an email. And I was like, listen, I love what you created. I think it's awesome. I feel like I was born for it and I want to get involved. And so he, he reached back out and he's like, this is amazing. You're American. Uh, you know, we haven't had Americans really compete in the sport yet. Uh, we'd love to plug you in. I was like, okay, well, you know, one quick thing, let me heal up my shoulder first and, uh, and I'll reach back out. So, uh, so that's what I did like a year and a half later, I reached back out and I was sparring again. I felt good. And he said, okay, well let's, let's get you plugged into the community. Wow. And what you said five years ago. So what did the community look like at that point? Yeah, so um, I was recovering from surgery in 2016, and uh, only one American had fought in a in like a, a smaller promotion, not not connected to the larger international scene. And his name was David Depto. Um, so prior to me, he was the only person to compete internationally. Uh, he fought in London. And there were a few other people in the United States, uh, a guy named Jared in New York, um, and, uh, and the head of LHS Boxing, and, and a few people were trying to get it up and running. But no one had gone to the World Championship yet. And, uh, and so in 2018, when I was like, hey, plug me into this community, he was like, okay, you know, it's not much of a community. We're small. We're passionate. It's, it's a niche. Um, but the only event we have for the rest of the year is the world championship. And I was like, pump the brakes. Like I'm just coming off of surgery. I don't know if I'm ready to take all the best people in the world of this. <laughs> it like, feels like a big, a big yeah. jump. 
I want, I want a warm up badge, you know, like, <laughs> like, can I do something like that? And he said, well, you know, it's in Calcutta, India. It's a, it's a hike. Uh, but if you did it, you'd be the first American in history to compete in the world championship. You could help kick this off in a real way in your country. And I think you should sleep on it. I think you should consider it. So that's what I did. I, I slept on it. I, uh, I thought about it. And I think my, my ego got to me. I was like, you know, even if I fly over there and get my butt kicked, at least I'll be the first person from uh, from the States to do it. And, and I, you know, how often in a, in a lifetime do you get to be the, the first person from your country to do something? How often do you get to represent your country competing? Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty rare. So, so I leaned in. I, uh, you know, I basically made it my full-time job preparing for the world championship for eight weeks. I had an eight-week fight camp. Uh, and that, that was, you know, morning, noon, and night. If I wasn't working out, I was playing chess. If I wasn't playing chess, I was doing some form of diet and exercise. So it was uh, it was all consuming and, uh, and and honestly one of the best periods of my life. Uh, to, to I, I wanna I wanna dig into what that camp looks like because I I think most of us know what it's like to study for a test, which mm-hmm. is probably the closest thing I can imagine that uh, a chess match would be. Most of us know what maybe preparing for. Uh, a high rank martial arts testing or competition might look like. Very few of us have had to prepare for both of those at the same time. But before we go there, what was it like going to Calcutta? What was that experience? What was the match <laughs> like? What was the community like? Dude, uh, India is the closest you can get to visiting another planet on Earth. <laughs> it, I've it heard is... people talk about that. Are you talking about the traffic and... and the chaos that is that or something all else? the above dude okay. all, you're walking around there's cows walking down the sidewalk with you well uh, i live in vermont there's... so that's not that foreign <laughs> but but okay it's <laughs> but, different but, when it's a but, rural it's yeah. different when it's a rural setting it's I, a, I, a whole other thing I, I, <laughs> when there's 10 million people in a city and cows are are you know we, we, uh, we battling for resources yeah. on the streets but no, it, people driving there is insane. People don't pay attention to any kind of like stoplights or, or anything. Uh, everyone's run, running red lights. And the way that you drive is you have to keep your, your eyes fixed forward because anything mm. could happen in front of you at any time. So peripherally, all uh, you, you basically develop like a sonar. So everyone's honking every few seconds. And honking is how you know like how close someone is or not. So it's like this, this like you know, huge herd of, of dolphins just hopping around everywhere, you know, s- screaming. So you, you know where it is and, and going there, you're just in a, in a constant state of high cortisol, high stress, because anything can happen at any time. There's all these sounds, all these smells, everything like bombarding you. And, uh, I, I, I definitely, um, prioritize and cherish my peace I like being in silence. I like, uh, you know, practicing in silence, all that kind of stuff. So when I arrived a week early to Calcutta for the world championship, it was like a hectic final weight cut, a hectic, mm-hmm. like last few training sessions, uh, you know, trying to figure out how much I could trust the food. All mm-hmm. of that was, uh, was really intense. Wow. Okay. That's awesome. It just, it, it sounds like such a blast. It, it, anybody, it, there are lots of ways you can cut the population into two groups. Hmm. But the one that I think is relevant here is people who like to do things that other people have not done. <laughs> and I'm imagining that because the way you talked about it, you are of that ilk that you like to be earlier. First, you enjoy discovery, exploration. Is that a fair assessment of you? Yes, I, although I think it's a symptom. So, so what I I think the source of that symptom is, is wanting to live a good story. Mm. And, and I think that's something like at my core, when I've been either tested or like faced my own mortality, uh, what I've come back to is like, I don't know what happens after we die. I don't know what kind of rubric we're being graded on. Uh, but if we're going to live this life, might as well live it to the best of our ability and and make a, a hell of a story out of it. And and this chess boxing chapter was meant to be that. It was meant to be a life experience where I grew up doing both. Here's a way to bring that full circle and and test myself on a world stage. And 
and what I thought would be like a cool climax to like a side quest ended up pretty much becoming the main quest <laughs> where like right. a, a bunch of my identity is tied up in, wow. uh, you know, being a former world champion chess boxer, being uh, the voice of our sport internationally through commentary and interviews like this. And, uh, and I think more and more of my career will be spent trying to grow the sport and attract more people to it. That, that's, that's awesome. And, and I definitely want to talk about those roles that you're playing in now and, and what that looks like. But let's go back, as, as I said we would, and talk about this training camp. You said eight weeks. You were all in. I, I get the sense that you know maybe you, you weren't, because you said morning, noon, and night. So that either means a very forgiving job or no job. What, what, did, what did that eight-week period look like? Take us through it. So in 2018, I was uh, running a nonprofit and planning events year-round. And the, the events would range from large tailgates with buffets, uh, bands, you know, a AV, um, to entrepreneurship summits, like conference style speaker series. Mm -hmm. uh, and then my main event model was something called Brawl for a Cause. Mm -hmm. Brawl for a Cause is the name of my nonprofit. And it's uh, a, a boxing event that features first time fighters fighting and fundraising for something that they personally believe in. Mm. So these are not people that grew up doing martial arts that have ever really even been in a fight. These are people like CEOs, celebrities, cops, firefighters, single mom, you name it. Anyone can sign up to fight and to fundraise for a charity of their own choosing. And in 2018, we had just finished our biggest event uh, in our history. We, we had passed the seven figure raise mark. So we, we, we had passed that million dollar mark. Awesome. And my board, um, for the first time, set a salary for me uh, to, to keep building the nonprofit outside of our fundraising events. And uh, the meeting after they set my salary, I said, hey, I want a little time off. <laughs> to uh, train for this chess boxing thing. But here's the caveat. I'm going to go through the same journey that our fighters go through to fight and to fundraise for something I believe in. Hmm. So I'm going to use, since I can't fight in my own events because, you know, there's a lot of operational work that goes into it. I MC those events. I can't do it in a Brawl for a Cause event. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to treat this Chess Boxing World Championship like a Brawl for a Cause event. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go through the fighter's journey, brawler's journey, where you know I haven't chess boxed before. I'm doing something scary. I'm getting knocked around and sparring. I'm having to call people to raise money to fund my trip. And then on top of that, to send as many kids to chess camp and boxing camp as possible. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was my goal. So uh, spring 2018, we have the big event. May 2018, uh, I announced, hey, I'm doing this world championship thing. And end of July was when the world championship was. So those eight weeks, I was able to uh, live off of my brawl for a call salary. I, I was able to fundraise to send me uh, and a corner man and cameraman over to India in order to track the journey, get a lot of footage for this, you know, birth of USA chess boxing. Uh, and then uh, use any kind of surplus to to pump back into Brawl for a Cause to help further our mission of youth and leadership development, uh, which chess and boxing falls under the umbrella of. Sure. So that's how it worked. Wow. Okay. <laughs> and, and and how about the mechanics of that training? Uh, percentage spent boxing training versus chess training? Did it shift through those eight weeks? <clears throat> Yeah, de definitely the majority was chess training. Um, and just because you hit a wall with boxing, with fatigue and overtraining, yeah. before you hit that wall in chess. So, uh, you know, at, at first I'll, I'll talk about kind of like who I chose for um, training in, mm -hmm. in each of these silos, each of these categories. And then we'll talk about how to weave them together. Because if, if you train chess boxing in silos, you're going to have a big disadvantage over an opponent that trains them together. Mm. And, and we'll get into why, uh, but it, it all comes back to this idea of state change management. 
Okay. Our, our, our body and our brain is constantly changing states throughout the day. You mm-hmm. feel a lot different first thing in the morning when you wake up, then after you've had your coffee, then after you've had a workout, then after you've uh, eaten a big meal and you're digesting it. All of these different kind of ebbs and flows of the day yeah. uh, are just a microcosm of a larger uh, pattern that you can recognize within yourself and you can start to uh, optimize and, and improve. And chess boxing is a really extreme lens to look at that state change management through. The part of your brain that you use when you fight is the the part of your brain that you developed and and, or that evolved first. So in caveman Mm -hmm. days, it's what kept us alive when there was a threat or when we needed to hunt. It's a very present state part of your brain. It's all the way in the back of your brain. And the part of your brain that you use when you play chess is what evolved the last. So literally opposite sides. So your prefrontal cortex is your center for pattern recognition, strategic thought, visualization, all the things that you need to use when you're thinking about action and reaction or when you're thinking about uh, decision trees for Mm. if I choose this line in chess versus this response in chess. And, uh, you know, it's the same part of your brain that you use when you business plan Or when you're in a relationship and you're thinking about the future together, it's a very future focused Mm. part of your brain. Okay. And I wish it was as easy as flipping a switch. And now I'm using the part of my brain that's perfect for whatever my next activity is, but it's not that easy. And uh, the more that you train for that minute in between rounds in between chess and boxing, the better you get at shifting your, your body's bandwidth and your resources to, to shift to, to prime for whatever activity is coming next. Mm-hmm. So uh, quick aside to say that I, I learned the hard way that I needed to start doing these things together. But when mm-hmm. I started out, I was doing separate workouts. My chess coach is the head of Chess Atlanta. He's an international master from Colombia named Carlos Perdomo. And he, on day one, invited me to one of his youth chess camps. This was, this camp was for eight to 12 year olds. Okay. Little kids. And then me, (laughs) a 200 pound, six foot one man. So I went to this camp and the first thing he did is he sat me in the middle uh, and he had each kid rotate through and play me. And he just Mm -hmm. wanted to assess where my chest level was. So he started with the 12 year olds and I started... (laughs) It's a little bit of foreshadowing there. Okay, keep going. I start playing the 12 year olds and I start getting beat. And not like barely beat. Like these kids are rinsing me. And these are competitive chess players at, you know, very young age. But chess is not a game uh, where age plays a huge factor. There, there are people on the grand stage that are in their, their teenage years that are playing against the world champion and giving them a, a run for his mm-hmm. money. And our current world champion became world champion when he was a teenager. Mm. So, yeah, they were little kids. And if we were chess boxing, man, I would have knocked them out. (laughs) But uh, it was just chess. And I get all the way to the last kid at the camp. And I'll never forget his face. It's this little eight-year-old who had, you know, some form of ADD or ADHD. He could not even focus on on our game. He was like watching the game next to us while he was beating me. And after he checkmated me, I was like, okay, all right. So I'm going to take five. I I went out to the parking lot. I sat in my car and I I looked in like my rear view mirror and I started crying (laughs) because I was like, I just signed up to fight in the world championship of chess boxing. I just told everyone in my life, my family, my friends, my whole like nonprofit community that I'm going to go represent the, the United States. And I couldn't even beat an eight year old. In, and and in if chess. I may, <laughs> just the way you talked about chess prior, you thought you were pretty good. Correct. Yeah. So like I, I was that little kid, right? Like I was going to the chess camps. I was playing in tournaments on the weekend but I had spent so long away from the competitive mm-hmm. scene in a time where chess progressed incredibly due mm-hmm. to computers, due to AI. Yeah. Uh, and ch- chess was really one of the first things affected by AI. Uh, in the 90s, Gary Kasparov, the world champion then, played mm-hmm. IBM's 
Uh, AI blue. chess. Yeah, exactly. Deep blue. So, you know, I, I stopped playing early 2000s and then this, this whole new crop of chess players came up uh, with a computer as their teacher. So I was good at a different kind of chess a long time ago and chess had changed a lot. So now I was faced with this crossroads. You know, do I, do I fake an injury? Do I come up with some kind of excuse of like, okay, I'm not actually going to do this and fly over to India to go embarrass myself? Um, or am I just going to see this as another challenge, another journey, and, and try to get uh, you know, as much improvement in my chess game as possible in those eight weeks while getting into fight shape, which I had a little bit more recent experience with prior to my surgery? And, and so, you know, I obviously decided on the latter. We've already talked about India and, and everything. So I kept going back to the kids' chess camps. I kept uh, getting better. One thing that really helped was not trying to learn all of chess, every opening, every response mm -hmm. that could possibly happen. And what I did is I just drilled a, a hundred miles deep on one opening and one response that played a, a really similar way. So as white and black, I could essentially play the same game hmm. that was very safe. It wasn't taking a lot of risks and it would kind of like uh, lead me or pigeonhole me into a, a longer chess game to, to maximize the amount of time that I'll have in the ring and try to so make what I, Go ahead. What, what I'm hearing, what I imagine just the way you would set this up was your game was I'm going to not lose at chess. I'm going to win in the ring. Correct. Or at least I'm going to make the game go long in chess hmm. so that either I can, I can maybe knock them out, knocking someone's out is a really tough thing to do, but at least I can use my cardio to be less fatigue and make less mistakes on the board. Oh, okay. So yeah, this, there, we're talking about the, the merger you you're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. So that state change management, your, your chess efficacy, when you walk into uh, the match and the first round is on the board, is like let's say let's say it's at 90 percent after the first round even if you don't get hit in the head even if you don't get your bell rung and you're a little like you know headache or whatever even if just your heart rate is up and you have adrenaline in your system you could come down from 90 to like 50 to 60 percent depending on how how in shape you are and how good you are at managing that state change management in between rounds so like even though I could be playing a better chess player, and this happened in my my final match uh, in the finals in Calcutta, uh, even if you're playing a better chess player, if they make a mistake due to fatigue, uh, it's it's way easier to capitalize on that on the board mm. than to knock them out in the ring. That you have to sense. have you have to have great technique, a lot of power. It's like a perfect storm of things that needs to happen to actually knock someone out. Uh, but it, you, you can exercise your advantage on the, uh, in the ring on the board, the next round, uh, mm. cause it's more likely for them to make a mistake. Does that make sense? Fascinating. It does. It does. This is, this is blowing my mind. This is so cool. I have never been a great chess player. I would never even call myself a good chess player because when I started playing chess, I was not patient. And it also reflected in my sparring. As I've aged, I've gotten better at both because I am more willing to be patient. And, and that's kind of what I'm hearing while you're talking about this idea of, you know, let's, let's play the rules. Let's play the opponent, not play the game I want to play, not throw the kicks or necessarily do the opening that I love the most. It's let's be balanced. Let's be versatile and see what comes to me. Totally makes sense. And, and I think with, age with experience with wisdom comes that patience and self-awareness mm. that leads to acceptance and then optimization leaning into your strengths and and that was a big kind of shift for me that happened really through in some ways through chess boxing mm -hmm. um you know that 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 idea of um i don't know if you've heard this quote but how you do something is how you do everything yes so I, I, through Brawl for Calls, I've had my hand in, in training over 200 people oh, for their funny. first fight, right? And and getting to know them first outside of the gym or outside of the ring, and then seeing how their personality is expressed 
through martial arts or through boxing, mm. it, it has been reinforced again and again that you, you really don't change a tiger's stripes. You, you, you really just uh, try to amplify what they already are as much as possible. And, and mm. for me, I'm a counterpuncher. I like to download my opponent, sit back, wait for mistakes, and then capitalize. And so when I'm training for the next chess boxing world championship right now is the state champion of chess. His name's Deepak Aaron. He is as aggressive as it gets on the board. Hmm. And he's grandmaster level in chess. He's, he's, he's higher rated in chess than anyone currently in our community in his weight class. So I think he has an excellent shot at winning the next world championship if he can survive the boxing round. So now that I'm training him to, to box, I'm like, okay, here's how you defend yourself. Here's a high guard. Here's how you use your feet to stay away. And he's not doing any of it. <laughs> he's watching Mike Tyson videos. He's coming to spar trying to knock everyone out, having never had a fight before. And I just, I like see where this is going. I'm going to like try to train him to be more defensive. And he's just, you know, going to do him. So now that begs a, a question. Are... Are the folks in the chess boxing community, do they play and box generally the same way? Do you is it common to have a aggressive boxer and a defensive chess player? Dude, this is this is my favorite thing about commentary. Like I have I have a great seat for every international chess boxing match. Sure. And because it's such an international sport, there's so few of us that we have to fly people in from all over the world mm -hmm. in order to have a good show. So what you see at any of these shows is this like Mortal Kombat style, uh, like, uh, you know, Olympics in every event where mm. the, the, the country that's represented, their culture is expressed through this fighter. And each country has a different relationship with boxing and chess. So I don't know if you've seen those like reels or, or TikToks or shorts or whatever, where it's like different countries and their like boxing style or their martial arts style. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So, you know, take that and then also like project that onto chess styles that you can be as defensive and boring as it gets on the chessboard. And you can also be like fireworks, exhilarating, aggressive risk taking on the chessboard, mm. just like you can be in the ring. Sure. And so to see how uh, all these different people from all over the world choose to express themselves on the board in the ring is incredible. It's like, there's nothing quite like it other than martial arts, but the martial arts, you don't have that high, high, low, low, that ebb and flow of uh, having to switch between two antithetical or opposite expressions, mm. uh, which is why it's, you know, it's my favorite sport. It's my favorite thing in the world. How often you, you mentioned this, this person that you're working with being in a very high level chess player. But if I, I understood correctly, no martial arts experience, is there a, a, is that common in chess boxing? Is someone come in with either, you know, no experience in chess or no experience in martial arts. And they're like, this sounds fun. Or are people more like you that they have experience in both? Yeah. The, the full spectrum. Um, I, like I would say generally the type of person that chess boxing attracts is your black belt rocket scientist, right? And you grew up doing martial arts. You learn discipline and hard work. Uh, you apply that to something that you're intellectually curious about. And you you use martial arts to keep uh, kind of, you know, in shape and, uh, and, you know, because you love it. And you have this, you know, job as an engineer or as a scientist or as a, you know, something, something mathematical in general. And, and along with that comes chess that there's such a massive overlap between martial artists and chess players, mm -hmm. because it, it both are, are at their core, the same types of sources. Uh, it, it is self-awareness and self-discipline. Mm -hmm. You got to know, know who you are and where you stand in order to know what to improve at and what to work on. And then it's a grinder's mentality of, of getting better at something that is an infinite game. You can never perfect chess. You can never perfect a martial art. Mm -hmm. And and so it's people that sign up for uh, dying in the pursuit of, of perfection or beauty in, in what, whichever expression that they choose. 
And so, you know, we have people that, um, you know, are like Deepak that, uh, you know, his, his grandfather was a highly rated grandmaster from India who played Bobby Fischer, arguably the goat of chess. Uh, and, and chess was like in his, you know, in his crib growing up, he, he was like born to play chess. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, later in life found jujitsu and then found, uh, boxing, which he did as a hobby for three years before he and I connected. Uh, so he has a little bit of a foundation in like applying his chess mindset to some martial arts prior to chess boxing. And then you have someone like, like Sakari. Sakari is the most accomplished chess boxer out of Finland. Uh, and he had 120 pro fights in Finland. Uh, and, you know, his grandfather taught him how to play chess, but he never had uh, like a dedicated chess coach. He had never been in a chess tournament and he was probably around like a, uh, you know, a, a 10, 11, 12 year old uh, competitive chess player. So, you know, when he started out, he was like, okay, I need to learn the most boring patient opening ever because if I get, uh, you know, a round or, or, you know, best case scenario, two or three rounds against his opponent, he's going to tear him up. You know, mm-hmm. he's going to make him quit. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and then, you know, those are two opposite sides of the spectrum. You have everyone in between and you also have the, the outliers. Um, someone like uh, this, this Latvian named Oleg. Oleg ha- had over 200 amateur fights and was a, a FIDE master level in chess. So when he joined our community, he was instantly just like the, you know, the big bad wolf. Uh, you know, he, he, no, no one could touch him um, because he, he was so excellent at both. He could kind of pull back in whichever was your strength and then go full force on the other mm-hmm. and, and beat you one way or another. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's all of it. How does it break down the endings? It, which is more common, that it ends on the chessboard or it ends in the ring? Yeah, about 80% of our matches end on the chessboard. But but like we were talking about before, it isn't necessarily the better chess player winning. It's right. just the mistake or the advantage is more easily seen on the chessboard. Mm-hmm. And, and a big factor of that is something that we haven't talked about yet, which is resource management. Mm-hmm. So we have state change management yeah, on one there. side. The other side is resource management. So you you, you have to manage, of course, your, your energy level, your fatigue. Mm-hmm. Uh and you have to do that in a regular uh, you know, martial art or, or boxing match. Yeah, yeah. Any any combat sports can require people, that. What a lot of people don't see is you have to do that in a chess match too. So classical chess, the game is at least four hours, uh, mm. and then if you get past move, I think it's fifty, you get another two hours. So that is a long, grueling, high calorie burn kind of day, yeah. and. Uh, in order for every chess boxing match to come to a finite conclusion, an objective result, which is something that we wanted to iterate on and improve from, uh, from boxing, because I think one of the ways that, uh, boxing MMA, uh, suffers is the subjectivity of, of judges. And that leaves room for corruption. That leaves Mm -hmm. room for, uh, bad results, which turns fans away. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing about chess boxing is over 99%. So like less than 1% of our matches have ended in a judge's scorecard. Uh, Because the the only condition for that happening is uh, is a, a stalemate or a draw on the board with equal rounds won in the boxing match. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that it's a weird, like edge case for that to happen. And the way that we ensure that is the, the chess games are timed. So not only timed in like, oh, it's a three minute round, then you have to go box. It's timed in that you have, depending on, on, uh, the level of promotion and, and when you're playing, um, you, you have six minutes to play your whole chess game. And if you run out of time in those six minutes, it's like checkmate. You lose. Mm. So 80% of our matches being won on the chessboard, well, a high percentage of them is people running out of time to play their chess game. And there's a lot of reasons you can run out of time. You can be in a really difficult position on the chessboard and have to use a lot of time to think through it. You could also be using that time to recover and try to get more time in the ring. 
It can be a strategic burning of time, not just having to use the time. And there's a lot of uh, other kind of ways to, to use that time. But using mm. that resource that you have is another like strategic level. If I'm moving too fast against a better chess player, I'm basically making it easier for him to reduce the amount of boxing rounds that he has to go up against me. Mm. But if I take too long, then he knows he doesn't really have to take any risks. He just has to play solid and move quick for me to run out of time. He'll never have to checkmate me. So it's this, it's this balancing act. And it's all yeah, these layers of competition that make it exciting and different every time. You know, it, like we love martial arts because we get to see two styles match up against each other, two different kind of strategies. And, mm -hmm. and you take that same kind of love for something within a, a martial art. And now you have a, a multiple of that same layer uh, that, that you can enjoy in, in, in a single chess boxing match. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I, I have an anecdotal kind of story from our last world championship. It's the first time uh, in our sports history where someone was able to pull off a brand new strategy. And because the sport's only 20 years old, we're still seeing a lot of those kinds of innovations and, and iterations on the sport now because it's like the early days. It's like the beginning of that, that bell curve, you mm. know, where it's like, okay, everyone's figuring out uh, all the ways to optimize and improve in the sport right now. Uh, that will be like, you know, perfect it over the next 100, 200, however many years. Wow. Okay. There, there's so much we can, we can dig into and we, we won't have time to go into all of it. But let, let's talk about your role. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that after participating, you, and, and, and I want to know about how and how long, you fill a few roles, you know, uh, it sounds like both at the international level and also at the national level. So talk to us about your role within chess boxing. Yeah. And it's a role I rejected for a while. Hmm. I, again, I, um, when I did this in 2018, I was focused on me and my story and this being a chapter, uh, of, you know, my memoir not in it helping the, you know, the, the greater community or the sport to grow or to make it to the Olympics or any of those things that now I've kind of taken up, uh, you know, a, a more community minded kind of uh, objective when it comes to those other things. Sure. But um, in 2018, Went to Calcutta, India, ended up winning my weight category, 90 kilograms, 198.5 pounds. And uh, my teammate who joined me in that, Kevin Von Carver, uh, also won his weight category, 95 kilograms, 208. And, uh, and both of us leaving that world championship were like, that was cool. Good life experience. We'll be bonded together for life uh, because of this cool thing we did. Um, but, you know, that'll probably be it. So had I started doing what I'm doing now, then I, I'd love to see where, where chess boxing would be. Hmm. But I kind of went back and, and, you know, started looking into whatever my next quest would be. Instead of uh, drilling down, getting more organizational and, and operational and building a USA chess boxing program. Hmm. So uh, what changed is in 2019, I went back to compete in the 2019 Chess Boxing World Championship in Istanbul, in Turkey. Why? You left in 2018 and you were done. What happened in that year? So a, a couple things happened. One, um, at parties, it, tur <laughs> it turned into the thing when I meet Jeremy that stuck in people's mind and people remembered yeah. more than anything else. It, 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 it made me a one of one mm -hmm. type of person. Um, and, and up to that point, Brawl for a Cause was that. Not many people start promoting fights and start a nonprofit when they're 21 years old. Sure. So I had a really early start in this, in this you know, fight promotion and, and boxing kind of world. And this felt like a level up in that same type of magical matter that, that exists that, that kind of points me in the right direction. So over the course of that year, 
the the amount of magic that would happen as a result of me talking about chess boxing helps reinforce that this is something worth spending time in. Um, this is something that that opened doors, that attracted more people, that uh, you know created an awesome story. And so um, when Ipe reached out to me and said, "Hey, will you fight again?" I did not do the same thing in making it my entire uh, you know existence preparing for the next world championship. I went through like a, maybe like a 70% kind of fight camp that I did in 2018. And I, I, I was, I was also nursing a, a shoulder injury. So I was like, my heart wasn't as in it. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the old, um, I forget the exact quote, but, uh, it, it, it takes different stuff to conquer the world than to rule the world. Mm. So, so people who are on the hunt, who are contenders to win that belt, that is a different mentality than keeping the belt and defending it. And I, I liked the conquest. Uh, I did not, I was not as drawn to the idea of staying on top. Mm. And this, this is reflective of something else we talked about earlier in our conversation, which is how you do something, you do everything. I'm an entrepreneur. I love getting from zero to one. I love starting things and either selling it or passing it off to operators. That's my whole career. And events are kind of like that. Uh, you know, you, you, you have a, a fight date, you have an event date, you prepare for it, you execute, you perform, and then it's done. Hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, this part of my personality uh, was expressed in 2019. I lost to the now world champion in, in 90 kilograms, a, a Frenchman, uh, who was rated 600 points higher than me in chess. So completely outclassed me on the board, hmm. which me, which puts me in a position to have to knock him out. Hmm. And we didn't talk about this part of the rule set, but um, you can win by checkmate or knockout. And knockout hmm. is kind of split into a couple categories. Knockout can be... One punch, boom, he goes down, can't beat a 10 count. What people think of when they hear knockout. But it could also be a technical knockout, mm -hmm. which is three knockdowns or stoppages in a round or four knockdowns or stoppages in a whole fight. Mm -hmm. And in the first round, I knocked down my opponent twice. Mm -hmm. And I, I had him on the ropes for that third stoppage that he survived right before the end of the round and he mm -hmm. checkmated me the next round. Ugh. So two th if two things happen, if, you know, I had a little bit more of a high gear or if I landed one more good punch, maybe it would have ended. Or if I was a little bit better at chess and state change management and didn't blunder in that final chess round, he wouldn't have been able to finish me as quickly. And I would have had one more boxing round to try to get two more knockdowns mm. um, or knock him out. So after that happened... It was the first time that Ipe, the founder of our sport, asked me to co-commentate the rest of the world championship together. So learning, uh, like losing to, uh, mm. you know, this, uh, his name is Tony, losing to Tony in an early round of the world championship set me up to have a free rest of the week mm. to co-commentate the rest of it, which turned into uh, the only time that uh, the founder of our sport has commentated a world championship and me being his co-commentator. Hmm. And it happened three months. Sorry. It happened five months before he passed away. Oh. So, so the last words that he said to me in person were become the Joe Rogan of chess boxing. Uh, you know, Joe Rogan podcaster and fight commentator for the mm -hmm. UFC. Um, and his, his last post on Facebook the day before he died was a, a USA Today feature, uh, wh which was the first national press that we got in the United States for chess boxing. And it was my journey to the world championship. Mm. Um, so, you know, these two things that happened kind of like set up and, and gave me this, this kind of signal. It's like, okay, I can either be another competitor in this chess boxing international scene and help the sport grow that way in, in, in that kind of uh, role. Or I can assume this, in my mind, larger role, not just fighting for myself and trying to win another belt, but instead telling all the stories, helping to translate mm. the beauty that we're seeing on the board and in the ring to an audience that might not understand it as deeply as the competitors 
uh, and, and that it, it could be opened up uh, and, and better understood and better appreciated if there is that kind of communication or translation role uh, in, in, you know, in that ringside commentary mm. slot. And so I, I talked to the other leaders in, in our community, uh, the, the other promoters that are leading the international events. And we decided we, we need an English face for, uh, uh, sorry, an English voice uh, for the sport. And, uh, and so in the next world championship, I didn't compete. And in all of the uh, promotional events leading up to it, all of the kind of jockeying for position in your own country and that kind of thing, I, I ended up commentating those. And, uh, and, and that's what led me to the, the biggest breakthrough in our sport, which happened last year. Okay. We're, we're going to, we're going to hit that. Cause I mean, you, you set up a beautiful cliffhanger right there, <laughs> but I'm curious because it, you know, it sounds like you're holding back a little bit on some of the emotional aspects of, of that 2019 journey and, and it starting in one way and ending in such a dramatically different way, coupled mm. with, you know, the loss of someone that I, I'm getting the sense you didn't know very well, but have likely come to know quite a bit in retrospect mm. through what they had built. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and hearing a lot of respect, not only for the sport, but for the founder. What was his name again? Sorry. Ipe. I-E-P-E. Ipe. Yep. I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that you respect Ipe considerably, even, even though he's, he's passed away. Am I, am I, am I reading this right? No, I hate that guy. <laughs> no, he, he is our charismatic founder. He is our, essentially what has turned into martyrdom. Like if, if I, if I zoom out it's and a, look. It's a great word because that, that's, you, you shifted and anybody who's watching this probably saw what I saw that as you talked about 2019 and him passing, your, your face changed mm -hmm. and it didn't change in the, in the way that one would expect of someone who, yeah, he, he happened, he was there, he was important, but we're four years later, four plus years later, and it, it still has an impact on you. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a guy that changed my life, um, and and who was a friend Makes and sense. mentor. So, so on a personal level, just like you know, a lot of people lost friends or loved ones during COVID, and mm -hmm. and that's when Ipe died. He died in mm -hmm. May 2020, uh, and then you add a layer of uh, now, you know, my career and my identity, and probably the rest of my life will be painted a color that he created. And so that there's a lot of reverence and gratitude that comes along with um, creating something that has, has changed not just my life, but a lot of people mm -hmm. in our community's life. Mm -hmm. um, okay. and, and so, yeah, I, I think what, what's coming to mind for me right now is, um, is something that, especially in our community, uh, martial artists or fighters, um, surrender. Is, is what's coming to mind. And I, I feel a constant um, tension and, and, and battle with the idea of surrender because as a fighter, you never want to give up. You know, you, 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 maybe your corner throws in the tower, maybe the ref calls it, but you don't want to lose because you give up. Mm. Um, you can be, you can be bested by someone else. That's great. That now you have lessons to take away from failure and to get better with those. That's awesome. Um, but surrender is is really tough uh, for for a lot of people. And 2019, the the you know my mantra after that world championship was surrender, because I am not the best boxer in our community. I'm definitely not the best chess player in our community. Um. At a time, I think I was the best at state change management, which is why I won my world championship. Uh, I was up against a better boxer and chess player in the finals. The reason I beat him is because he made a mistake in the first 15 seconds of the round, which leads me to believe that I used my minute before better. But uh, when I lost in 2019, it took a degree of surrender and acceptance that my role in this community is not in the arena anymore. It's not mm. fighting to, you know, have my hand raised or to have another belt. 
my, my role is a little bit more behind the curtain and it's going to help lift other people up and, and put them in the arena for them to have their hand raised to amass a, a fan base to build storylines around. And the ego wants that to, to be about yourself and, and surrender is that counterbalance to ego. It's letting go and, and flowing with whatever is actually meant for you rather than what you want to make happen, uh, you know, at all odds. And, and there's times for both, but um, there, there's been a lot of, um, of surrender and acceptance since 2019, especially because what came right after that world championship, December, 2019 was the pandemic. And we had to accept being stuck inside, not being able to go to the gym, go to the dojo, not we being able to, to do what we really, you know, feel like we were put on this planet to do. Uh, and had to find other ways to, to express and to stay healthy and to connect and, and all those things. And, and I think that, um, to focus on surrender, to meditate on it, to, to practice, uh, to practice surrender is, um, it's something, it's something that you said earlier, uh, which is that, that cultivation of patience and wisdom that comes with the, you know, 10,000 kicks, the, the 10,000 hours uh of 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 mastery well all right now I, i'm going to admit the the you telling that part of the story and the emotion contained in it i completely forgot what you had teed up for me <laughs> before we went there where where was it that you were going to take take the story yeah I, so um our inflection point uh, so I, I come from startups, you know, I, I, I come from, um, re really the business world. And when you look at, uh, the starting of, of these big companies, you have this, this pattern that forms of, um, you have a passionate, charismatic founder that starts a company and, and attracts this this justice league of early employees uh, that build a really quality product that solves a problem and attracts uh, a, a user base that that leads to scale. And for about twenty, about almost twenty years, we had that that start that zero to one process. And in 2022, uh, a, a massive influencer named Ludwig Agron, uh, who made a name for himself as a Twitch streamer, uh, he, he ended up beating the GOAT of Twitch streamers, Ninja, as the most subscribed to Twitch streamer during COVID, when everyone mm -hmm. was watching Twitch and YouTube. And YouTube acquired him. Uh, with an exclusive contract to only stream on YouTube for the biggest buyout ever for, for a streamer. So uh, a year after he went over to YouTube, he got a big budget from YouTube to stream live events on their platform because they wanted to build up that vertical on YouTube and they wanted sporting events to be a part of it. So Ludwig had an idea to do a smash boxing event. You ever play Super Smash Bros.? Yeah. So he came up in the Super Smash Bros. FGC community uh, and he decided to weave together uh, Super Smash Bros. Melee with boxing. So you would play Melee for a round, then you would switch to boxing, then you would go back and forth. And as he looked into getting it sanctioned and getting it insured, he found chess boxing and decided to plug into the existing sport and community uh, in order to host both. And that's around the time I got in touch with him. Um, he was having trouble sanctioning and insuring it. Uh, I had been doing that in Georgia for almost 10 years with Brawl for a Cause. And the former head of the, the California State Athletic Commission, um, sorry, he was the former head for Georgia that now oversee, uh, oversaw California. So I had a personal relationship with the guy that Ludwig needed to talk to in order to get the event to happen. So... Um, I got in touch with him. Uh, I helped him get a sanction and an insurance. I helped him train his, his fighters, which were all big YouTubers and uh, YouTubers and streamers. 
And in December 2022, he hosted not just the biggest event in our history, the, the views and impressions generated from this event exceeded the aggregate of 20 years of our events all combined. So in 24 hours, he had done over 10 million views. We had over 300,000 concurrent live viewers. And it was a massive coming out party for this sport that this little niche community had been building over the course of, of the previous 19 years. And uh, because I was able to help him behind the scenes, he let me co-commentate the event with him next to the biggest chess uh, YouTuber, um, Gotham Chess, Levy Rosman. So the three of us called the fights. Levy oversaw the chess. I oversaw the boxing. Ludwood made it all entertaining. And, uh, and, and we made this massive tidal wave that we're still riding. We're still surfing it uh, over a year later. Mm. And this was the first time that the traditional chess community accepted chess boxing as more than uh, you know, a, a, a satire, more than, more than a court gesture mm. uh, of like, you know, Oh, well, Magnus beat Hikaru, but what would have happened if they boxed after? It was it was no longer this joke. Now we're seeing actual high-level chess players, grandmasters, uh, being featured in Ludwig's event. And all these other Twitch streamers that play chess are now trying to get onto a chess mm. boxing match because it amplifies viewership. It's a compelling story to tell. It's good content. And, and so now we can, we can use this model of influencer chess boxing to grow our base. They will not be the best chess boxers in the world, but they will attract the most viewers. And if we can use that as a yin and yang of really high quality fighters that have no following, that are the best at it, with these people that are maybe good at one of them, or maybe just really entertaining and, and willing to try it, if we can build cards with both, now we have viewership for high-level chess, chess boxing. Right. And so this inflection point that showed chess boxing to the world, and we'll always be grateful to Ludwig for it. He'll, he'll always have a, a page in the history books for chess boxing. And maybe if he continues to, to promote these, uh, which you know I, I'm still working with him to do more, maybe it, will, it won't just be a page. Maybe, maybe he'll be one of the huge figures that has a chapter or multiple chapters in the chess boxing mm. book. But... Uh, but because of his uh, involvement in the sport, it, it changed the face of it and the trajectory of it to where now we're no longer going from zero to one. We have proof of concept and we have adoption. Now it's it's one to X. It's time to scale it. And I haven't taken on uh, the, the challenge of scaling something very, very many times in my career. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm approaching my mid thirties and up until now, I've just done zero to one every time. I, I just love creating and handing off. It's the most fun part. It's the most fun part. Uh, and it's the part that lights me up, gets me passionate, wakes me up in the morning. You know, like I, I love that part. Me too. And back to surrender, there's, there's this sense that now I'm meant to evolve also. Mm -hmm. I'm meant to uh, focus on, on helping to scale this because if not me, who? You know, there, there are these other kind of world leaders in chess boxing that all kind of have their role. And my role is going to be building the, the United States or North America side of chess boxing. So starting to attract more fighters, more fans, uh, and to, to tell its story uh, through YouTube content, through live streaming, and through our international events. And so, you know, we're, we are doing this at a perfect time. Uh, you know, first month of the new year, my big resolution is to double down on content creation around chess boxing mm. and to build a kick-ass Team USA for the next world championship because it's, it's being hosted by Russia. What better antagonist could we possibly have to go live a Rocky Four story, go over to Eastern Europe where, where they're hosting it. They're going to host it in Serbia most likely. We get to go over and 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 battle the the snow and the best people in the world at chess boxing, which is Russia. Russia wins every year, and mm. and try to have this underdog story with uh, with with some chess grandmasters that have never fought, with some incredible right. fighters that are rudimentary at chess, and this ragtag group of of chess boxing 
uh, American superheroes that uh, that that need to channel their inner Stallone and, and this, take on the Russians. This is every late '80s martial arts film in in real life, and I absolutely love it. Which leads to the question: How can how can I? How can we? And I don't just mean we as Whistlekick. We as this this broad global audience. How can we help? It's time to ring. How the- do we get involved? How can we watch? Hey, it's 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 time to blow the 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 dog whistle that only chess yeah. boxers can hear. You know, it's it's it is time to to sound the alarm. I've held back from publicly being like, okay, I'm organizing a team. We're gonna figure out how to fund it. We're gonna get sponsors. We're gonna fly over and compete in the world championship. Every time in the world championship, it's been me and one other American. Hmm. That's all it's been. Like people reach out and be like. Oh, uh, you know, who do I need to be to my weight class to join Team USA? It's like, dude, if you can pay your way over there, you're on it. Like, this is not like a competitive. <laughs> it's like, if you're willing, come on. We're, we're not there yet. We're not we'll there, there yet. It's the beginning of it. Yet. And you can help build it. And for some people, that's really exciting. For others, it's really daunting. Uh, but this year, it, it's it, that changes. You know, it, if mm. you have any interest in combining your martial art experience with chess and challenging yourself, even if you have no chance of winning, even if you just want to live an incredible story and challenge yourself in a new way, come on. We'd love to have you. We want to bring a mm. big team USA. Uh, we want to, we have almost a full year to prepare. It's going to be uh, November or December, 2024. So plenty of time to uh, get with a chess coach, to start training boxing specifically, to start learning state change management and how to weave them together, and to challenge yourself in a way that few on the planet have been able to do. Mm. Uh, Which, you know, if that doesn't excite you, this isn't for you. Tune in and watch it. Support us that way. But if that does get, you know, spark a little fire in you, uh, you know, reach out. And, and, uh, and, And really, that's the purpose of, uh, this conversation, you know, the collaboration with Sensei Seth, um, the more content that I can create or collaborate on that gets chess boxing out there, the more experiences like the one I had sitting in my recovery bed with a, a YouTube video that auto played, mm-hmm. the more experiences like that I'm, I'm going to be able to offer to other people, the more calls to action. Or, or you know, in a hero's journey, it's called an inciting incident when a hero is pulled into uh, their their quest. Mm. Uh, that inciting incident moment happens from interviews like this. Someone hearing this right now will sign up for Team USA chess boxing, will compete against Russia, and will live out their their hero's quest. I, I know this audience, and I'm thinking of people. I'm not going to go so far as definitely not going to name them, and I'm <laughs> probably not going to reach out to them directly. But I, there are names I'm thinking of. There are folks that I know well enough to know this is right up their alley. So my challenge to all of you out there in the audience is: every one of us has a chance to take this this thing. We, we most of us know what it's like to feel like, and you didn't use this word, but I, I'm going to a gimmick. And in the early days, the way you described the way the international chess community saw chess boxing, that was the word that was coming to mind for me. Because we all know what that feels like, we all have, I feel, a responsibility to maybe lend some energy. Doesn't mean you're on the team. Doesn't mean you're watching every match. But you also know people who would find this really cool. It could be a beautiful gateway into martial arts for your friends that have no interest in watching martial arts. So get out there, watch, participate, reach out. How would they reach out? What what kind of contact, website stuff do they need? Yeah, at Moving With Matt on all platforms. Same exact handle. Moving With Matt, the T in Matt only is one. One okay. T. And uh, yeah, send me a DM on any of those. We have a Discord channel uh, with a chess boxing Discord where we upload workouts, we share progress. And in Atlanta, we have a weekly training on Saturdays at 2 p.m. at Decatur Boxing Gym. Uh, And we'll be broadcasting those trainings leading up to the World Championship. We'll be uploading our workouts so you can do it along with us at home. Um, But if you're in the Atlanta area and want to come physically do it with me and the state champion of chess, Deepak Aaron, uh, he leads the chess, I lead the boxing, uh, and the state change management training. So 
Uh, that's the best way to get in touch. And I, I, I'll also say, uh, you never have to take a punch to train chest boxing. If you want to strengthen your, your, your mind and body, if you want to improve your strategy, your strength, uh, you can use this as a vehicle for personal development and for performance enhancement. You, you don't have to put yourself in harm's way. You never have to spar. But doing both at the same time, you, you get incredible benefits from it. You're going to be able to more rapidly prime for whatever comes next in your day. If you're, if you're in sales and you need to present and perform and close, it is like it is like right before a boxing round where it's like, okay, this is it. I'm here right now. I've visualized success. I've done my breath work to be able to, to engage uh, my, my brain to get more oxygen in my bloodstream to be able to be at my best in this moment. There, there are translatable skills from, from doing chess boxing as a hobby. Not, not just at the highest form of competition. Mm. So if you want to take this up as a hobbyist, we'll, we'll have more and more resources coming out. Uh, I, I, would, I would point mostly to my YouTube. Uh, so so youtube.com backslash at moving with Matt, uh, where, where we'll be doing a lot of state change management videos. And like the co collaboration that sparked this conversation with you, Jeremy, uh, with Sensei Seth. And if you want to learn more about that sport, I think he did. Uh, an excellent job of breaking down how it works, making it he, funny, he does. Uh, making it entertaining. So check out that video too. And, and shout out to Seth. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you being here and you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to wind down here, but I want you to hang on because, because we've got something to talk about after okay. we wrap here, Great. but to the audience, I mean, you, you've got your marching orders now. This is, this is cool stuff. And it's, you know, like we said, towards the top, it's not often that, you know, here we are, closing in on nine years doing the show that we get to bring you new things, but we're always looking to bring you new things. And, and thank you to Seth. Thank you to Andrew for, for making all of this happen. So if you want to go deeper and you should, you know where to go, <laughs> check out the show notes. We're going to have everything linked in there. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com. Maybe you're driving in the car and you don't have time right now, but that's where you want to go. And so here we are, Matt, we've talked about chess boxing, but most of the audience is not, they're not chess boxers. They're, they're not yet, at least anyway, they're, they're martial artists of all, all ilk. I, I think the one thing that they, most of them have in common is that they at least understand if not speak English, right? Cause we, we don't, we, we broadcast this show in English. What, what do you want to leave them with? What thoughts, words, how do you want to wrap this? Because it is a martial arts community uh, and, and, and podcast, I will say one more thing that will lead into uh, what, what I'll leave everyone with. And um, for a while, I, I was kind of lost in what my next quest would be. Um, and even though I'm kind of taking up chess boxing and growing it as my, my main quest line, I still need these sub quests or, or side quests or goals uh, in order to feel whole and, and to be excited mm -hmm. about life. And so um, one that I took up recently is uh, pursuing my black belt in Taekwondo. Taekwondo was my first martial art when I was a little kid. I, I started when I was five and uh, I moved around a lot with my single mom when we moved from Charlotte to Atlanta there wasn't a place I could practice that was convenient. That was close. Mm. So I stopped at purple belt when I was a little kid and, um, through a brawl for a cause event, we had a Taekwondo, uh, black belt, uh, fourth degree a guy named, uh, Dane Turner, um, compete in it. And he and I became friends, uh, from it. And I followed his journey to becoming a two time national champion in, uh, combat Taekwondo in, mm. in sparring. And he lives close by, uh, and my uh, my New Year's resolution and and newest series in in uh, on YouTube is back to black belt. Um, mm. So I, he is leading me through uh, kind of an expedited catch up, getting me back to purple first, uh, and then I'm going to catalog the journey to all the way to black belt. So uh, if you like that kind of content, if you want to see me you know, try spinning back kicks and, and falling over and, and iterating to try to get better at it. Come check that out. And what I want to leave everyone with is 
Um, it is never too late in life to start something. You, you may be sitting here thinking, I've been in my martial art for 20 years. This is what I do. This is how my body moves. This is how I, uh, you know, this is what I know. And, and, and all my friends are in this space. Why would I branch out? Mm -hmm. Why would I try something new? And to me, that, that kind of uh, feeling that I get when I start a new journey, when I start back at white belt and I'm being humbled and I get that really fast pace, the, those, those goosebumps, those, those, uh, you know, failing to, to fall forward kind mm. of moments, uh, when I feel most alive. And, um, if, if you're looking for something new to try, if you're looking for a new goal, uh, what I'll leave you with is, is the encouragement to lean into it, to take an action step towards it and just start and see where it goes. You, you can hate it. You can stop it at any time. Um, but you won't know it'll always kind of be an idea in the back of your head until you, you turn that potential, potential energy into kinetic energy and, and take action on it. So I had been wanting to, to achieve a black belt, uh, since I was a little kid, I, I was approaching mid thirties and kind of looking down the barrel of like, maybe this will never happen. And I decided not to accept that uh, and, and to start taking steps towards it. And, and uh, I only say that to, to say, I, I hope it encourages you to do the same. And if you want to watch someone do on, on their journey to doing that, come check it out on YouTube.